Hi everybody, my name's Ben and I'm from Reach Out Australia and I'm here to talk to you about managing exam stress. Uh, more than 220,000 students will go through Year 12 exams this year, so it's a pretty big deal. It's the biggest deal for many of them that they've had in their life up until this point. Um, many people feel like their lives depend on the Year 12 results. This webinar is designed to help you support your child through this really tough time. And to help me out with that, I have Jackie and Akil. And Jackie, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Well, um, I've been involved with Reach Out just for, for most of this year, actually. But um, the reason that I'm here is just to offer a parent's perspective, having had two awesome children, they're now in their 20s, who have been through um, exam stress of HSC and still going through that at university. Great. Thank you. And Akil, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'd been a youth ambassador for Reach Out for a couple of years. I finished my high school exams in 2013 and I'm currently in uni, so the exams haven't left me quite yet. <laughs> cool. And I'm Ben, I'm from Reach Out. I help to run the communities that we have online. Um, and yeah, I've also got with us on, via video, we've got Jeanette James from the Principals Australia Institute. Um, she couldn't be here with us today, but she's got some great advice for us a little later on. If you have any te technical difficulties, please just check your webinar screen for a few help options. Um, there should be some more details in your email and an address you can email um, Webclass Cloud, the people who are hosting this, on to get a little help to connect up if you're having some trouble. So, we're going to try and cover quite a bit in the hour we've got together today. So, um, first we'll talk about the concept of stress because it's actually a, a kind of a weird term and it's good to be on the same page. Then we'll explore together with a poll um, how we recognize stress in our child or children. Um, and then we'll talk about a few ways to support our teenagers. And finally, once the exams are over, um, the support isn't over. So we'll talk a little bit about what to do to support your child um, after exams. So yeah, and then we'll go through some resources and have a and a so, Akil, could you tell us a little bit more about stress and where it comes from? So I think the main thing to understand about Year 12 is that the sources of stress are just absolutely everywhere, like Woody in this picture. Um, it can be from your academics, it can be from your social life, it can be from your extracurricular commitments, it comes from everywhere. And the other thing is that like, stress is a natural response to all the things that you have to deal with in, in Year 12. Um, you know, the way, and the way your body is going to deal with all those pressures will be very different from person to person, but it does affect nearly everyone in Year 12, I think. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And tell us a bit about this really complicated looking curve. So this is a graph of how well you perform versus how much stress you find yourselves under. So I'll just go through it. I think when you have a lot of stress in year 12, it can be really overwhelming. Um, you can feel overworked, like you can't accomplish anything, and that's obviously going to negatively affect your performance because you won't be able to focus on your work, you won't be able to focus on anything. On the other side of that curve, if you have too little stress, if you're too relaxed, you might argue that you're probably not going to try as hard as you should, you might be watching too much TV and not focusing enough, and your performance won't be great either. The real point that you have to try and get is this ideal stress, where it helps you to reach your potential without negatively affecting you. So as a parent, it's important for you to like show the importance of the exams to your kids and put them under a little bit of pressure or stress, but not so much so that it negatively affects their performance. Right. Yeah. So there's too much stress, but there's also too little stress. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, I think that especially there are different times in the year when you can have different amounts of stress. But a common time is after the trial exams, when you're finishing up your school year, a lot of kids go completely down and they have next to no stress. And then the HSE exams can creep up on them a little bit. So that would be an example of a time when you'd have very right. low stress. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So. Now that we've kind of gotten a bit of a definition of stress, I'd like to ask you all to help us fill out a poll. Um, we've got here a lot of different options um, of different ways that you might recognize 
stress and more importantly unproductive stress so too much stress in your child so I would love you to start filling out the polls now and perhaps we'll talk amongst ourselves about how we might recognize stress in ourselves or in our children um, although <laughs> Akil and I don't have any children so we can't do that. <laughs> well I can probably comment since I had two very, have two very different children and dealt with the HSC in very different ways and it's really interesting that the graph that you were just talking about and the high stress and the low stress so I have one of each. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, one child who probably didn't couldn't even spell stress you know because he was so unstressed and I do remember saying to him at one point maybe a little bit of stress wouldn't actually hurt. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then the other one who was probably so stressed out that it was really um, really difficult and challenging for her and, and for me as her mum as well. So that's probably one point to note that everybody mm. is different as well so that's a really, um, I mean, that's probably one of my messages to let parents know that each of your kids is different and maybe how you support them needs to, you need to adapt to their different styles and different mm. stress levels. Absolutely. And so the way we can show stress or the way we might see stress in other people is very different. It differs, it differs for every person. Like, I know that I sleep terribly when I'm stressed, um, but I don't generally have trouble concentrating. I'm generally a little more focused when I'm very stressed. So, um, yeah. Looking at the poll results, I haven't seen many people fill in yet, so please click. We've got one person who selected other, so... Well, I'd probably be in the other category. I think I'm the exact opposite to yeah. you, Ben. When I get really stressed, I just like go to sleep. I'm just like, I can't <laughs> deal with anything. I'm just going to bed. I'm not sure if that's laziness, but um, I think it just shows that like people do respond to stress very, very differently. And my parents like caught wind of that. So if I go to sleep at like 8.30 at night, they're like, you're stressed, what's up? Right. So every kid really is different. There we go. So there's lots of different um, what we call coping mechanisms. So some people deal with stress in a particular way, um, and that might just be sleeping. Yeah. Um, some, some people may self-harm or other things like that, and we can talk a little bit about more about where to go to get support around things like that a little later. But for now, I think we'll move on and perhaps revisit this poll a little later. So there's five ways you can support your teen. Um, the first one is managing stress. So we've defined it, we've talked about recognizing it, and now we're going to look into um, how to work through it, how to get it back from overwhelming stress back to the kind of stress that pushes you forward and helps you work, think, um, work through the problem. Um, we'll then do a little bit on planning, balance, and routine. And then we'll have a great video from Jeanette about um, how schools can help and what they're doing to help manage stress with your teenagers once you send them off. Um, finally, we'll go on to environment and a bit about communication. So, managing stress. So I think we've talked about how stress is very multifaceted in terms of the sources and the way that kids present them. Mm. Um, and I think that's what you have to keep in mind as a parent, that like it's not going to be a formula which you can easily recognize. It's very different and will depend on your kid. The next, next thing I would say is that sometimes the stress is going to be in the control of the kid going through the exams and sometimes it won't be. And that makes a big difference in terms of how you deal with it as a parent. So for example, like if your kid is stressed about getting their exam results back, it's very different in whether they like have their exams in two months and the strategies are going to be very different. So stress as well as having different sources can come in different flavors and you're going to have to have different coping strategies depending on what it is. But in terms of specifically how to deal with it, there's a couple of things. I think the first thing is that don't go to your kids too like aggressively, I would say. What I found pretty frustrating at the start of year 12 is that my parents would be like, are you stressed? What's wrong? Are you stressed? And when someone does that, your response is just be like, please go away. I think more just observing and like passive probing or just asking them questions which don't directly relate to stress is more likely to get an answer which will give you more information. Um, the second thing I would say is don't jump the gun to give them advice. Sometimes what you want to hear, particularly when you can't control the stress, so like, I think I screwed up my exam, what am I going to get, is to just empathize and listen to your kids. I find that like, 
Sometimes I would complain, I just want someone to listen to me. I don't particularly need advice. And a lot of the stress goes away when someone just listens to you and just nods and says, mm-hmm. Like, sometimes that's all you need. And I think, yeah, that's, that's particularly important when the stress isn't under their control. And the last thing I would say is that it's not a one-off solution. Just because you sat down with your kid and said, OK, I understand you're stressed, this is what we're going to do, that shouldn't be the end of the conversation. You should constantly be checking in with them to make sure that they're OK, and that should be something you do, like, you know, every week, every couple of days, depending on the situation. So I guess, yeah, those are my main tips for managing stress. Great, thank you. Um, all right, Jackie, would you like to t tell us a little bit about your own experiences as a parent and what you found helpful in terms of balance, planning and routine? Sure. Well, um, I think balance is really w one of the most um, Im important criteria for stress management and for, um, and for assisting with the kind of study routine and everything. I'm a huge fan of exercise and um, I know that a lot of um, a lot of people might forego the exercise because there's so much work to do, so much study to do, but I think it's really important to keep that exercise up. If you're in a team sport, keep playing that team sport and encourage your kids to do that. You know, it's, it's only, you know, a couple of training sessions and a game, but that's really, really important to break up that study routine and it's, um, it's just so healthy to do that. And obviously healthy, eati healthy eating goes with exercise. So the healthy food regime is also really important. So I'm really big on that. I think routine is super important as well. Um, regular sleep is really important. But what I would also say is that it's probably up to your child as to when that sleep pattern works best for them or how that sleep pattern works best for them. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you're an early to bed person and an early to rise person, it doesn't mean that your child, that that works best for them. So if they want to be a night owl studying, that's fine and sleep in a little bit more in the morning, I'd say that's fine. But keeping to a routine and getting enough sleep is really important. But let them determine what, what works best for them in, in that way. And I think also that kind of appreciation and of, of giving them some autonomy around that mm -hmm. I think is really important as well. Okay. So yeah, healthy body, good food regime, exercise um, and good sleep patterns are super, super important. Also can't be underestimated the importance of a study routine um, and the study plan and actually sticking to that. But I'm actually going to pass over to Akil to say more about that because he's probably got more, exper more recent experience <laughs> around a study plan than I have. So certainly I'll just um, make, uh, say how important it is, but um, if you want to give some more information around that. Yeah, for sure. I think the thing with a study plan is that there's a really, I think a lot of people do it and it's very easy to do wrong in some respects. I think the first thing in terms of just the way you organise your study is to make sure you're taking lots of breaks. So when you are studying, I think you should spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes when you're studying and then take 10, 15 minute breaks. Work in chunks like that and you're more likely to be productive. What I find really, what I found really tough was when I would just sit down and try and study for three hours, I'd get nothing done. I'd saturate how much I could do after 40, 45 minutes and then I just wouldn't concentrate at all. Um, but specifically about how to organise a study timetable, it can be as detailed or uh, have as much or as little detail as you think is necessary. So when I, when I started my HSC, I needed a lot of information on my study timetable because I was finding sometimes I was too ambitious with what I could accomplish. So, you know, put in your commitments. So when you're going to be exercising, when you're going to be playing sport or your instrument, you know, what time you're working, what time you actually should be going to sleep, when you're going to be studying. Putting all of that on at the start can be really helpful. And I know it, it might sound a little bit dorky to do all of that and plan your day so much, but it can be really helpful. And then as you get better at it, you can, you know, cut it down. Um, I think it's really important, as a general note, um, a helpful tip that I've uncovered with study um, you'll often hear kids in the library, and I used to hear this at school and at the library as well, as like, oh, like, I'm going to study four hours today, I'm going to study three hours today. I think that's a really harmful way of approaching a study timetable. I think it should always be goal-oriented. So today I'm going to do 
this past paper and I'm going to revise this topic. If you just say you're going to study for five hours, you haven't really told yourself what you're going to accomplish in those five hours. And you might just sit there, open a book and not actually do anything. What I find is much better is if you say, you know, the specific tasks you're going to complete. It's something that you can easily tick off or easily cross off and it makes you more likely to actually get those things done. And in terms of when you set out your schedule for the week, you can be, it'll be easier to split your time between subjects because you'll know exactly, okay, I have this to do for this subject, this to do for this subject. When can I do it on each day? So I think it leads to more productive study. Great. So do you use your phone or anything like that to remind you to do things or are you more of a paper planner person? Oh, uh, like I've recently started using my phone and like, um, like the alarm system to like remind me of really urgent things that I'll often forget. Um, I think it's really good, like technology can and should be embraced. Um, during my HSE I was a bit of a dinosaur so I did everything on like pen and paper and a diary. But yeah, more recently I've just been using iCal and just like calendar apps. I think they're much more easy, you can colour code things, it's, yeah, it's great. Okay, so you can plan a few ways and sometimes you can set it out. Yeah. and then kind of set reminders and things like that yeah, exactly. to make sure you're on track. Yeah, and that's really helpful. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. I feel like I'm ready to actually study something now. <laughs> <laughs> just need a subject. <laughs> yeah, I just need something to study, but I, I know how to study it now. So, okay. Um, so now we're going to go over to Jeanette James from the Principles Australia Institute. She runs a program in the Institute called the Mind Matters Initiative. Uh, they work on supporting schools to support their students um, with anything to do with mental health, but they focus on well-being, so keeping people happy and well and helping them to manage their stress before things get too tough. Um, if you want to find out more, go to www.mindmatters.edu.au and over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Jeanette James and I'm the Senior Project Officer for Principles Australia Institute in the New South Wales office. Principles Australia Institute, or PAI, deliver and support two federally funded mental health initiative, Kids Matter Primary and My Matters, and we work in partnership with Beyond Blue and the Australian Psychological Society in all schools around Australia. I would like to thank Reach Out for organising and providing this webinar for parents of HSC students. My role here today is to share with you how schools support Year 12 students. I'm a parent of a Year 12 student, in fact, his last lessons are this week. My previous roles include secondary school teaching for 20 years and a partnership broker. I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 9-year-old son. Schools have experienced a gradual paradigm shift recently and this is very exciting. A balance between academic outcomes and character development is increasing. Opportunities to explore how schools can strengthen the mental health and well-being of their community is embraced. Knowledge around neuroscience and how mental health difficulties can impact learning is making its way into classrooms more than ever before. And we are working at breaking down stigma so more and more youth can seek help when it's most needed. There are over 1,385 secondary schools. 1,321 combined schools, K-12, and 435 special schools around Australia. And this is not including 6,200 plus primary schools. Schools obviously vary in how they support these 12 students, but as a general rule, schools provide parent information sessions regarding the HSC and study tips. Some go further in exploring and providing a set of common links on the school website or a parent portal. Important links would include information about the EAS, the Educational Access Schemes, the exam provisions information, Board of Studies links, My Future or similar career support, illness and misadventure forms into exam or assessment days, and a section for help seeking is integral, how to start conversation tips, where to find a mental health professional, what is mental health, what is the difference between mental health and mental illness, these conversations are worth having. Our Mind Matters Module 1.1, or 1.3 rather, offers a fantastic animation to this effect. This is great to share not only with staff, but students and families. A school newsletter or information on the school's website, including a Year 12 dedicated tab, would explain the EAS for those who have experienced long-term educational disadvantage. 
Schools can support families with an impact statement. However, schools are not responsible for this application. Other schools organise HSE study programs in the holidays or after hours, and quite a few schools are now utilising HSE in the holidays program, which is supported by major universities. You can Google HSE in the holidays for more information. Expert HSE teachers provide intensive workshops based on a variety of HSE subjects. I have seen schools initiate walking study buddies at lunch, guest speakers to help manage stress, develop effective study habits using optimal performance workshops around sound nutrition advice, sleep patterns, time management skills. skills schools are drawing upon ex-students to mentor and tutor smaller groups as part of their volunteer programs and giving back to their communities. This peer-to-peer -peer work is very effective. I enjoy see, seeing chillax zones in schools and mental health and wellbeing captains in place, capturing student voice and seeing student-led initiatives such as mindfulness techniques and gratitude practices used in homerooms. This often assists with keeping things in perspective, especially important in the HSC year. These consistent messages about perspective, balance, effective study habits and stress less tips are enhanced when clear messages are delivered from the school and home. This week Reach Out released the One Click Away report. Working with schools we find access to adequate and timely mental health support is often difficult for students and families. Access to digital support however via apps and online mental health support can increase help seeking behaviours. Schools are sharing with students apps such as Worry Time and Breathe. The Reach Out app Breathe in particular is very useful for those students experiencing anxiety prior to an exam. Slowing down their breathing provides a sense of calmness and increases rational thought, which is always good prior to an exam. It is very important to trust your instincts. We are seeing more families and schools working in partnership to recognise experience, students experiencing mental health difficulties. The Mind Matters Component 3 can support schools put procedures in place to communicate effectively with parents and meet parents' information needs. Mind Matters offers a framework to guide and support schools to strengthen mental health and well-being of its students using a whole school approach. Mind Matters is a free resource and at no cost to schools. Within the home, ask your child what they prefer. Maybe you think you should keep the home extra quiet with less social gathering, yet that quiet and change of noise level can be unnerving for them. They'd be more comfy with the hustle and bustle of your home. Give them time, it's often hard to think on the spot. Ask them to keep note of daily routines and provide hints of how we as a family can support you over the next month or six months. This may include a favourite meal or a dessert or as a study or goal incentive, a healthy smoothie, having use of a car to get to and from exams instead of the added worry about using public transport, agreed reminders about gaming and social media use, helping set up a more effective study space, providing healthy snacks such as hummus and celery or a maxi bon treat, whatever works for them. Our kids are also different. Our New South Wales Education Minister is aware of the pressures of the HSC. Not too long ago, new HSC reforms were announced that will start taking place with the Year 11s in 2018 or the Year 12s in 2019. Capping the number of tasks to reduce stress and anxiety and focusing on depth, not breath, will consolidate learning. HSC questions will be redesigned to um, assess the application of skills and the depth of knowledge. Being aware of the signs of a student experiencing mental health difficulties is important for both the school and home. This can be tricky as many signs and symptoms can be confused with just a moody teen. However, trust your instincts. If your son or your daughter is experiencing slow withdrawal from any normal pace of life, hobbies, sports, friends, um, perhaps getting louder when normally quiet or quieter when normally loud, or expressing thoughts over harming themselves, please seek advice from your school counsellor or see the Reach Out Emergency Help tab for other phone call and online support. I'm sure Ben and Jackie may mention it, however, if you are concerned about your team, check out the new Reach Out Parents Forum. There is also a There Is Life After Reach Out.com 
where some well-known Aussies provide their HSC and life stories. As we know with teens, the messages are often absorbed better coming from someone else other than us. Final words, the HSC is a team approach. Keep the students at centre, it is ultimately about them. Ask them what they need, don't assume. For many students, the HSC is a big deal and we shouldn't trivialise these feelings. It is their world at the moment. As trusted adults, we can support, guide and just be there. Stability is really important and keep positive. Talk about things other than the HSC and school exams. And there is more to life than the HSC, we know that, perhaps some consistent messages. Keep communication channels open and varied, and as other panellists may allude to, balance is the key. And don't in underestimate the importance of good nutrition, keeping hydrated, working on a healthy mind and positive thinking, exercise and sleep. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That was really informative. Um, I'd like to go back to the poll quickly because we figured out our little glitch and we've now got a heap of results. So if you look in the, I think it's the lower right hand corner, um, you'll be able to see the, the scores for the different poll results. Um, and we had two high scores. So we had feeling irritable about themselves or those around them um, and feeling panicky or down, which I think kind of go hand in hand, don't you? Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Did you? Did either of your teenagers get a little irritable, or did they manage stress quite well? Well, a little bit irritable, but really the the feeling panicky and down was particularly relevant for for my daughter, and mm. so that was that was challenging for her and difficult to manage. Yeah, absolutely. And I wish at the time that um, reach out that we'd known about reach out and it was available because it was quite a few years ago because there's lots of fantastic online resources there. Yeah, and I have to say I help to run the forums and I talk to young people every day who are feeling just like that and don't know how to tell mum and dad about it, that it's more than just like a behaviour, they're just not dealing with things right now. So, yeah, um, if your uh, child can't talk to you, perhaps maybe just leave them a link somewhere to our forums and maybe we can help them get to the point where they can talk to you a little bit more. Um, and I think we also had uh, having trouble concentrating. So that kind of makes sense from a, um, a brain perspective. The more uh, adrenaline or stress hormones we have running through ourselves, the harder it is to think about more complicated things. So yeah, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Or? I would just add that um, I think the biggest stress and pressure that I personally put on myself was like from myself. The stress wasn't from school or my parents or teachers. It was the stress I put on myself. And I think that's why people feel irritated. That's why they feel defeated sometimes during the HSC because everything is not going to go to plan. That's just, that's just how it goes. Um, so I think a cause of a lot of these symptoms is the pressure and the stress that um, I, from my experience that I put on myself. So I think that managing that is often a really good way to help get rid of some of those things. Mm. And the last one I just want to touch on quickly um, is defeatism or the what's the point attitude. I think it's a little different to the other ones because a lot of, a lot of these are kind of, you know, first line stress responses. It's just, I can't deal with this and so I'm not dealing with other things as well because of the pressure that's on me. But defeatism seems like a bit of a, um, almost a way of trying to argue your way out of the stress perhaps. Is that how you two see it or do you see it a little differently? I think it's more like you've kind of given up. I think if you have had, you know, a couple of bad exams or a particularly tough time, it's easy to just be like, resign yourself a little bit to the situation. And yeah, I think, I think defeatism will just come from resignation after a while and that's what you have to try and stop it early before it gets to that stage. Great. And I think another way of handling that is to just take that take that break, just step yeah, back exactly. from it, step back from it for a bit. Do things and that make you that happy. Being flexible with your study plan um, mm. and knowing that this is actually what you need now, just step back from it and encourage your um, your son or daughter to do that and mm. take the time. Jackie, I've got a tricky question for you. <laughs> <laughs> <Great. laughs> what What would you say to your child if they said, "What's the point? I don't want to do this. It doesn't matter anyway." Wow, that's, that's really tricky. tricky. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> well, 
okay, so let me think about this. If they said that to me, um, there are there are lots of other options, you know. HSC isn't isn't the be all and end all, but I think one of the things that you started off this webinar saying is that it's probably the biggest thing they've done to date. But there will actually be other things and there is a life after HSC and there are other pathways, so there's lots of other um, avenues, I guess. Great, that's awesome. So I, I, I really love um, what I'm hearing there, which is unconditional support. So even if the exams aren't, the be, aren't gonna be the thing that gets them into uni, or even if it's not the direction they end up heading in, you as a parent would still support them because, okay. yeah. So that's great. And if you have a child who's got that kind of defeatist attitude or just isn't feeling great, then perhaps that's one of the best things you can do. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, just before I move on to the next slides, I'd like to point out the ask a question button. It's in the bottom right hand corner. I'm getting the thumbs up because I can't actually see what you can see. Um, <laughs> uh, please do ask any questions, share any comments or thoughts. Um, go nuts as of now and we'll keep an eye on them and just try and respond as we can. Um, we'll see how we go. At the end we will have a little bit of time for a Q&A. So, right. Finally, back on track. Jackie, can you tell us a little bit about what you did to make a study-friendly home? Sure. Well, this is what I tried to do and I hope that I achieved it. So this is what I think is important. I think my biggest tip on, um, on a study-friendly home is a calm environment. And I know that that's not always easy, particularly if there's lots of other, um, lots of other children. Um, you know, it might be a noisy home, there might be lots of people coming and going. But I just try to say, I try to encourage you to keep, keep kind of noisy activities to a minimum, try to minimise distractions. If there, if there are other siblings, um, maybe try not to have so many of their friends around all the time, although sometimes good is good too because you want to also keep some normalcy, I think, throughout the whole study period, because I do think that's important as well. But from a parent's perspective, um, I would also encourage you to try and be home um, maybe more than you have been or as much as you can be. That might mean um, reorganising some of your work routine, it might mean uh, reducing or minimising some of your own social activity. But I have to say that I think that's really, really important to just be around. Um, and you might be around a lot and you might not even hear from your young person very much and they might not really feel like talking to you when you're there. But Sometimes they will, and if you're not there when, that, when they want to, then you're really missing out, and you've missed out on that opportunity to be supportive. So what I'd say is, yeah, keep a calm kind of environment as much as possible in a family environment and with everybody's busy <laughs> lives, but maintaining some bit of normalcy, and just try and be home, because if you are around, it enables you to check in and, and encourage them and just show that support. And I think that they will recognise that, even though they might not say it. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely for me, just like, it feels nice when someone's, like my parents were at home when I was studying, even if I didn't talk to them, it was nice just having them there. And yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but it's just nice having another person in the house. Yeah. I've actually heard that a lot and from my own children yeah. now, you know, years after the HSC. So that, that's why I'm, I'm kind of sending this message out that I think that's really, really important. Mm. So if they're a little aloof or a little bit annoyed, that might be a sign of stress rather than a sign of what they actually think about you being there to support them. Would that be right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think in most cases they're pretty happy that you're there, but they may not actually tell you that. And, um, <laughs> and you know, afternoon tea is always good too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of snacks, just, you know. Yeah. And just a nice, a few, a few kind and calming words. Mm. Great. <laughs> They're my tips. That's pretty good. Thank you so much. Okay. So next we're uh, on to Akil again with some tips on talking or communication. We'll go through some of the good things and some of the things that it might be good to avoid. Well, I'm obviously addressing this from the perspective of like a student who just went through the HSE and kind of what I wished my parents would have done and what I think they did as well and from my friends' experiences as well. I think the first thing, and it, and it relates a lot to what you said, is um, just to be engaged and just to be there for them. I think that you can't often force kids during the HSE to talk about what they want to talk about. If you 
probe them with like what's wrong you're not going to get the answer if you're just there you're genuine and you're curious so you're not always just asking them what's wrong you also want to know how their day is how their friends are they're more likely to engage with you um, if you're not just asking them about their exam results which they got two weeks ago which they've already forgotten about but you actually know oh look they got they had this exam I wonder how it went if you're if you if you know a little bit more about your kid which I think does come from spending more time with them in my experience like when my parents did ask what I was having that week they were more likely to ask how it went and I really liked that and it didn't feel like it felt like they were just trying to be my friend they were being just genuine and that was really really important for me um, the second thing that's up there is to be engaged and, and act engaged and yeah we mentioned that can be difficult especially when you I know I was really aloof and really irritable during the HSC but I guess my advice to parents would be just persist. Um, like kids don't mean it. They they like do want to talk to you. They do love you. Um, just keep 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 at it. Keep trying with them. Um, always just try and understand how they're going. Even if they give you a bit of a crappy response, don't take that the wrong way. I know I did that a lot of times, and my parents kept on persisting, and I really appreciate that them for doing that. Right. And yeah. going back to Jackie's point, it's partly about just leaving the door open a little bit. Exactly. So being engaged doesn't exactly, doesn't have to mean engaging them. You don't have to pick them up and go, tell me how your day was. But letting them know that you are there when they're ready to talk is really amazing. Yeah. Do you think so? I agree. <laughs> I, think, I agree. I think the point is you, you may not often get a lot back from them, <laughs> but just persevere. I think that was, yeah, <laughs> that was the main. Yep. And you know, and it's worth it. And, mm. yeah, and you can't force it, as you say. Exactly. You can't say, well, now's the time we're going to talk about something. But you're just there, makes it easier. Great. And what about guide by the side, not stage on the stage? Yeah, I personally didn't experience this, but I had um, s some friends whose whose parents dictated a little bit. I think too much of what they, how much they should study or even what they should do after uni, after high school rather. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be really, really tough for the kids. I think it's really important to be self-motivated and to feel a sense of ownership and responsibility for your, your year 12. So giving them the space to think what they want to do after, how much they think they should be studying is really important. So try and have like those open, end of discussions with them rather than telling them what to do, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree. And what about barriers? What are the, some of the things that you found a little hard to get through, if you're comfortable with sharing a little of that? Oh, there's, <laughs> I think it's often, and I think this goes back to what we were just saying, there are all these barriers to communica communication, sensing your parents are not genuine, they're not listening, they're being too probing. And if you slowly shed away all those barriers, you might just get a little glimmer of insight from them or they might be honest with you. But there are so many things I feel like often just stop you, will stop me in particular from just talking to my parents. One of them would be, I found particularly frustrating at the start of year 12 was my parents would only ask me um, about like how my marks were, like after the exam and I was like, and of course they were asking just like how I was going and they were monitoring, you know, like, is that what I was expecting or what I wasn't, but it felt like I would have been nicer if the, that was consistent throughout the year. So I think always keeping the door open and talking to them whatever the time of the year is, is really important. Um, the second thing that's mentioned there is n not really listening to them. Um, I was 17 when I did the HSC. I was, I was very mature. My parents are much, much more mature than me. and like. Whilst I very much appreciate their advice when you're 17, that's not necessarily how you think. <laughs> and being told what to do doesn't always resonate and, and work the best. Um, also, we've talked about how stress is so multifaceted and just sometimes when, I, when your parents kind of just like start giving you advice, like, no, 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 you don't understand, you don't understand. And I think you just have to let your kids and I found this particular, just let them vent, let them, so you can understand the full story of what's happening and you'll be able to help them in the best way. So don't um, jump the gun or reach conclusions is what I found with my parents. And yeah. Do you think that the over advising can cause more stress? Yeah, it, it, it does. You already have enough stress 
during the HSC. And I think he, as a parent, the role should be to try and remove as much of that as mm -hmm. possible uh, to help to help out. So adding to it, yeah, doesn't help, unfortunately. <laughs> so mm. so the, the temptation can be very strong just to jump in because you may well know exactly the what, right and thing And what's to best do, for them, yeah. But it's hard to get your teenager to understand that as well. And that's the tricky bit. Exactly. So that listening and empathising that you've mentioned previously a couple exactly. of times actually yeah. is so, so important. Mm. Great. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the suspenseful moment after all the exams are finished and the last multiple choice question or essay has been written down. <laughs> um, but before the results are actually released, everything's kind of out of your control at that time. So it's pretty reasonable to feel very stressed. Our brains are somewhat wired for worrying. Um, we often think about the bad things that could happen and it's hard to also think of the possible good things or some solutions that you could work through even if the worst happened. So there's a lot of things you can do to kind of work through this period of worrying. Um, and again, it goes back to talking and communication, spending lots of time and lots of doing lots of listening um, and leaving the door open. So giving the opportunity and letting, the, letting your child know that um, they're welcome to come to you when they're ready, if you can get to that point, um, to explore the worries and to talk a, bit, a little bit about it. And just listening can be a huge deal. And the last thing is that support and that unconditional support. So, hey, look, some of us stuffed up our exams and that's okay. There's other things you can do to get into tertiary education if that's what you want to do, or other pathways to other careers. There's lots of possibilities. It's not just about the exams. So after that, we have um, when the results are released. And I kind of focused on the um, what could happen if the results weren't quite what you thought they would be or what your child thought they would be. Um, but maybe we can think about what happens if they were great and whether there's some support you need to do there as well. But to start, um, don't be fooled by indifference. Don't be fooled by this, ah, oh, it doesn't matter anyway, you know. Um, most of the young people I've talked to in my community, and I talk to thousands and thousands a year, do care and it's often what we call front so it's not um it's kind of a skin deep thing so keep leaving that door open and keep encouraging them to talk because um below that um kind of i don't care attitude there's probably a fair bit of hurt and a fair bit of a hit to their um, self-worth or their self-esteem and what they feel they're capable of. So you might have a little work to do to help build them back up a little bit um, and to help reassure them that it's not all lost, um, that there's thousands of places offered through the preference process alone. So, you know, uni still might be a possibility um, and keeping things in perspective. And one of the best things you can do is to actually find plan B with them, support them to figure out what they want to do next. There's a saying that I really like, which is called, where there's hope, there's happiness. So help them figure out what they want to do. Once they've taken the hit, it's time to figure out what to do next. And again, support them no matter what and let them know that, show them that. You might be a little bit unhappy about their results. Okay, fair enough, but show them that you still support them and you're still there for them just like you were through the exams. So uh, now we're going to talk through a little bit of some of the, uh, some of the resources that we have available to us. Um, and to start, Jackie, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the Reach Out Parents site and what's on it and what you think it's good for. Sure, Ben. Um, this is the one that I'm involved with. So um, I'm one of the parent moderators for the Reach Out Parents site. And it was only launched, I think it was in May this year, so it's only a few months old um, and we're building a community of parents there so we'd love everybody, um, as many people as possible to be involved there. Yep. And what it is, it's, a, um, it's designed as a support network for parents to share experiences and to ask questions around issues that their young person is going through and the idea is that you can share those stories and, um, and support each other so all the parents can support each other 
around common issues that, that, that you're all facing and as parent moderators, issues that we've actually faced in the past. So hopefully we can provide some, um, some advice and assistance really in terms of uh, resources that you can access and things that may have worked for us that might work for you if you wanted to try them. So that's really what the Parents Forum is about. Um, and I think, I think it's a great initiative, obviously, that's why I've become involved with it. Um, but I think it's a really good extension of the work that Reach Out's been doing for young people to actually now engage with parents and say, yeah. we can provide support for you as well because that in turn will help your young person. Great. And so we don't just have a parent's site. In fact, most of our site is for young people. Yeah, so for young people like me, um, Reach Out has a, a lot of really great information relating to exam stress in Year 12, but a whole host of other topics. Um, sexual health, stress, um, there, there are boundless topics for anything to do with mental illness that can be found on the website. I think it's, it's really helpful in a couple ways. Uh, the first thing is the, the information sheets. So what's particularly I think helpful is that, you know, if you're just struggling with something, some, sometimes you don't want to talk to anyone and you just want to get some advice. And reading that on a website with information that you know is going to be good and helpful, like Reach Out, can be really helpful. The second aspect of the website that's really good is the forums. Um, I think the internet and these forums afford us like anonymity and confidentiality that's really important with a lot of mental health issues and exam stress. We've mentioned before that sometimes it's really hard to talk to your parents, your teachers, your friends about stuff relating to mental health. Sometimes jumping on a forum and talking to a complete stranger is ironically the easiest thing to do. Yeah, yeah. and I, def I run the um, uh, community for young people and I have to say the anonymity lets you say a lot of things that you wouldn't feel comfortable saying to your close Definitely. friends or family. Definitely. Um, and that can often be a great point, uh, a starting point for them to figure out how to say it to you. So please do send them our way. We read every post. We'd love to talk. Um, likewise for the parents community. The final one I just wanted to link you to is Youth Beyond Blue. Um, it's run by Beyond Blue, who I'm sure you've heard of. Um, the focus is mostly for people living with depression or anxiety. So if your child has some symptoms of anxiety or depression, if it's a bit more than just the normal amount of stress you would expect, go to Youth Beyond Blue and find out a little bit more. Um, this is pitched at young people, this is pitched at your teenager, so it's a really great place for them to learn a bit more and decide what they need to do next to get the help and support they need. And we have heaps of apps, so we'll run through these too. Um, the first one is Reach Out Breathe. Akil, I'm pretty sure you use it. Yeah, Reach Out Breathe is a really, is a really fun app. Um, basically, you just put your finger like on the camera off your phone and it will tell you your heart rate from that. And I found that was really helpful, you know, before giving speeches or presentations or something that was high stress, you can use it, you see your heart rate is elevated and it'll actually give you techniques to slow your heart rate down and calm you. And it, you wouldn't think it, but it's, it's really helpful to just take your stress down, particularly in high stress moments, like just before a presentation, just before an exam. So mm. really helpful app. That's awesome. And we know that our bodies and brains are connected, funnily enough. So if your heart's racing, then there's lots of blood running through your brain and there's lots of stress hormones and chemicals moving through there. Just breathing and focusing on your breath and slowing everything down again can make a huge difference to how escalated or wound up you feel. Um, another great app that we have is the Recharge Sleep app. Um, this one's a bit of a, a program. It goes over about six weeks and it helps you take a look about at your mood and your energy levels and it helps you think about things you can put in place to, uh, I guess, deal with some of the stress and also have a little bit of a healthier routine around sleeping and things like that. Um, and another app which we didn't make but we love um, and it's certainly we use it daily on the forums um, is Smiling Mind. Have either of you guys used Smiling Mind? I haven't no. used that one, no. Okay. Well, so Smiling Mind is for people who think uh, mindfulness or meditation is a good idea. Personally, I love that but I know not everybody does. Um, so 
it just does really simple guided meditations. It just helps you um, do, again, things like focusing on your breathing, the sensations in your body, and just slowing down a little bit which in turn helps your brain slow down a little bit and manage stress. Um, finally, there's the check-in app, which Beyond Blue have written. Beyond, uh, the check-in app's amazing because it allows um, your teenager, or perhaps even you, to check in with, um, with each other and see how you're going. It's a way to just kind of keep track of how things are going and to ask for help if it's needed. So that brings us to the end of the presentation part of this. We'll have a little time for questions in a second, but I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to kind of sum up. What are the most important things for you and what do you want to share as a last word for this presentation? Jackie? So me first, okay. Um, key messages from me are about around being supportive and I did mention that you know everybody's different so you need to work out what works best for your child but also maybe something I didn't mention was perhaps just ask them ask them how they would like to be supported how what is the best way I can support you through this and you might need to ask them a few times because different days might get a different <laughs> response um, so you know ask and and try and support them as best you can and the other thing that I want to say in in parting is make yourself available because I think that's really I think that's really really critical so that's just reiterating the stuff I said before about just being around a bit more than you might have been a bit more than perhaps maybe you want to be curtail some of your own activities just to be there and just be in the house and just be available and just having that presence in the house and it was really cool that you said how important that was yeah. to you just because because your son or daughter will actually feel that you're just there even though they might not be talking to you about <laughs> it so they're my my kind of key messages okay Akil. Oh, so much pressure after so many great final words um <laughs> i think i think the main thing would be when you find that your kid is being the most frustrating that's probably when they need you to be there the most so when if your kid responds with frustration or irritability, uh, don't run away from that. Persist because I think that uh, that's when they're most likely to talk to you and that's when they need you the most. And I suppose my final words would be, uh, we're all in this together. So it's kind of a team effort at the HSC. Your child's the one going through it, but everybody needs to help out a little bit to get them through to where you and they want to get to. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, just before we go into the question and answer section, I just want to highlight a few options for emergency help. Um, sometimes there's more than stress, um, and sometimes stress can trigger other things such as symptoms of ill mental health, whether that be depression, anxiety, or other things. Um, so if you're worried about your child or about yourself, if you've ever thought of hurting yourself or your child has thought of hurting themselves, then it's okay to talk to any of the numbers here or any of the sites here. All of these places, Lifeline, Kids Helpline and Suicide Callback Service, they don't just have a call line, they have web chat, so you can go on and type if you don't feel like talking. Um, and they're not there for the absolute emergencies or not just there for that. They're also there to help you decide if you need a little bit more support and help you figure out what to do next. So um, have a chat. They're always very welcoming and very helpful. Um, if it's really serious, then they can help with that. But if you're just not sure and you just want to know, that's fine too. OK. Um, so we can continue the conversation over on the parents' community. If you want to talk a few, through a few points, if you don't agree with what we said, if you have other things that you think are important to put across, we'd love to hear about it and we'd love a post or two on the parents community. We'll be waiting, I'll be reading and I look forward to chatting to you. Um, and I think we have a Q&A slide next. Oh, let's go back one. So we'll also just do a quick Q&A because we've got about five minutes left. Um, we have a, a couple of questions, although they're not sh all showing up, so I'm really sorry if I miss yours. I think we only probably have time for one or two anyway. Um, so I think the first question we'll go to, um, this was sent in via email a little earlier, and I'll just try and read it out, so bear with me. Um, the question was, what if my daughter decided to quit year 12 and chose to go to TAFE, 
where she can uh, and then go to uni later. She is living with depression and felt so trapped in high school. Any advice? So, that is a tricky one. So, I guess the first bit of advice I would have is, is the school doing everything it can to support your daughter? And if they gave her more support, would she want to stick around? Um, perhaps that's enough, or perhaps TAFE is an okay choice. There's no reason she has to do the exams if TAFE is what she wants to do. And, and TAFE might be, you know, it's definitely a viable option. It might be a good option for her. I'd also just probably explore the, um, the part there saying that she's suffering from depression and anxiety and just, just explore whether you've got the right help and support for her in that regard. Yeah. Because if there can, yeah, if there's more um, help and support that you can get for her, her, then that might actually make the school situation improve as well. So there's a couple, there is a couple of layers to that. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I, I don't know, if you're listening or watching this later, I don't know who you are, so I can't contact you directly. But if you would like to make a post on the forums and tell us a little bit more, it's completely anonymous, and we can help you figure out what to do next and explore the options you might have already explored, but also maybe find some new ones that you didn't know existed. So please do. I really encourage you to make a post because there's so much we can do to support you and we'd love to have a chat. Um, uh, okay, and I think this, this one we covered a little bit, um, a little earlier, and it's tips, it just says, tips to help when avoidance is being used to cope with stress. So I guess, any tips? What do we do with avoidance? Um, it's, it's pretty common <laughs> to use avoidance to, um, <coughs> to cope with stress and probably more so when the person is actually suffering from anxiety because they'll just want to avoid the yep. study situation and the exam situation altogether. Mm. Um, in terms of how you deal with that though, I don't quite know what the best answer is. Mm. I mean, I guess recognising that it's real is always a start and empathising and listening um, yeah. about before. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think the main thing would be like what's the source of the avoidance it could be some underlying mental issue which should definitely be addressed and just going back to that in the last question i think a lot of times a couple of my friends were going through mental health problems in year 12 but everyone kind of passed it off as oh it's just year 12 oh it's just year 12. i think it's important as a parent and for anyone to recognize that any mental health problem in year 12 doesn't have to be just because of it it could be something else so it's really important to take it seriously and not just clump it as that. But specifically to this question in um, using avoidance, you know, I, I remember I specifically did that after I had, you know, like a bad exam or a bad week or two in school and I, you know, had that defeatist resigned attitude and I was just like, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. So, you know, if you understand that's the problem, then you could tell your kid, you know what, like this was just one exam and even if you don't get the marks that you want, there's all these other options out there for you, the kind of stuff we've discussed. So. I think the biggest thing there would be like, why are they avoiding study? And if you can do that, I think you're in a much better position to tackle the problem. I agree. I think the answer is kind of in the question. Um, you're, uh, you're saying that avoidance is being used to cope with stress. So it is a coping mechanism. This is what your child is doing to deal with the pressure that they're under. So one thing you can do is help them to find other ways to cope with the stress and perhaps that will mean they're less reliant on the need to withdraw or shut down because it's just all too much. So um, things like um, Smiling Mind, the mindfulness app, are really great because they can help you kind of pull down your current level of stress. And if you're not into mindfulness meditation, then have a go at Breathe. Um, breathe, again, is just about helping you kind of get to a sort of lower level of stress. Um, yeah. Or, send them to us, we'll talk to them. <laughs> um, yeah, and again, if you want to talk more, please go to the parents forum, or uh, if your young person doesn't feel like talking to you, well, we're happy to talk to them on the reachout.com forum, and maybe explore it to the point where they can start sharing with you because they feel a bit more comfortable, or they've got their hand around it a bit. They might just not know what to do or what to say to ask for help. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. I just quickly wanted to thank Webcast Cloud, uh, who are the amazing people. You can't see them, but there are a lot, a lot of screens and wires and cables and things um, just behind the camera. 
um, and to very diligent people who've helped run this, put on the polls and everything else, and also Edu Webinar, who are absolutely amazing as well. Um, and that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. We'll be waiting for you over on the parents' forums. If you need to talk more, need to think about anything else, we're there. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Akil. Goodbye.